Hi, I'm Abby, I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday. So welcome back, or welcome, if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. Around this time last year, as we were ramping up to the Vinyl Monday season one finale, I did a three-part Woodstock miniseries. Part one was Janis Joplin's Cosmic Blues, the record she released right before she performed Woodstock. Part two was Joni Mitchell's Ladies of the Canyon with her own Woodstock anthem on it. And part three, was CSNY's Deja Vu with their cover of Joni's Woodstock. For this year's summer miniseries, I've decided to spotlight three massively significant records, all released within six weeks in the fall of 1969. I believe that all of these records would, in some way, dictate how rock and roll in the 70s would go. We're starting with the first of that trio. This week's album is... Abbey Road by the Beatles! Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post my hints to what album I'll be talking about next. I host polls over there. You can find that on my channel. There's always so much to get through with these Beatles records, so I won't waste any more time. Let's take the plastic off. So my copy here is a repress. This was a Capitol Records reissue from the 70s with that purple label. And I have the 50th anniversary box set. This came with the Giles Martin 2019 remix and two discs of outtakes, including the singles, Polly's Goodbye, and the studio demo of Something. B-Roll Abby will be showing you all of this a little later. Um, I nearly bought an original copy with the cover misprint for like a hundred dollars not too long ago, but I just bought the albums for the Vinyl Monday season finale, and I'm really not in the place to be dropping a hundred dollars on a Beatles record. Let's talk about this cover art. Here we have perhaps the most iconic piece of album art in rock and roll history. It's the reason EMI Studios renamed themselves to Abbey Road after all. This cover was photographed by Ian McMillan on the crosswalk outside EMI. The original idea was to get a photo on Mount Everest since Abbey Road's working title was Everest, but this concept didn't make it very far. Paul being barefoot on the cover poured gasoline on the Paul is Dead theories fire, but there's actually a perfectly simple explanation for this. Paul was wearing new shoes that day, or sandals maybe, it doesn't really make a difference. It was a sunny, hot August day in London, the shoes were too hot, slash giving Paul blisters, so he just took them off, and barefoot Paul made the winning shot. Now, I may be alone in this camp, but I love the back cover shot. It's so good, it could have been a front cover. The idea was to just have a photo of the Abbey Road sign, like I have on the back of my outtakes, but an accidental photo bomber in a blue dress became the most famous backside in rock and roll. This is actually the second time I'm talking about a famous blue dress on Vinyl Monday, and I have replicas of both of them. The identity of this photo bomber has never been confirmed. It's likely this woman, whoever she is, has no idea she was on one of the biggest records in the world. The crew thought the blue dress was such a nice tie-in to this blue that they went with the shot. On Abbey Road, we of course have the Beatles, Paul McCartney on vocals, bass, guitars, piano, Moog synthesizer, the wind chimes on Sun King and various percussion, John Lennon on vocals, guitar, piano, Moog, the white noise machine on She's So Heavy and various percussion, George Harrison on guitar, lead vocals on Something and Here Comes the Sun, backing vocals, some bass, organ, Moog, and 
various percussion, and Ringo Starr playing drums, the anvil on Maxwell's silver hammer, and wouldn't you know it, various percussion. We've got a couple special guests on this thing. We have the only man to record with both the Beatles and the Rolling Stones, besides members of the Rolling Stones themselves, I guess, Billy Preston on keys, and we have George Martin on harpsichord and organ. Abbey Road was produced by George Martin, engineered by Jeff Emmerich and Phil McDonald, and assistant engineered by Alan Parsons. Keep an eye on that guy. He might do something pretty important in about four years. Fun fact, this is the only episode of Vinyl Monday that's gotten completely demonetized. Thank you, Roger Waters. Not very cool. I know it's not his fault, but I still love blaming things on him. And now for your host this evening, The Roll Transitions. <laughs> Alright, so, the Beatles are fresh off the whole get back thing, that ended up being the rooftop concert, and eventually let it be. Paul McCartney really wanted get back to be the thing that got all the Beatles back on the same page, no pun intended. Uh, it ended up doing the exact opposite. Of the four of them, John is most engrossed in outside pursuits, namely his relationship with one Yoko Ono. They've gone all into activism and art making together. By the end of the Get Back ordeal, John has stepped back from his role as de facto leader of the Beatles. The new leader was Paul, who tried his very best to hold the band together through the Get Back debacle. No one believed in the Beatles more than him. He's donning a couple new hats in life, husband and father. Paul marries American photographer Linda Eastman, now Linda McCartney, in the spring. They have their first child together on the way, and he adopts Linda's daughter from a previous marriage. Meanwhile, George is casting out his gaze a little farther. He's ventured out on his own for a few solo projects, namely the Wonderwall soundtrack three months earlier. He's getting closer and closer with his favorite collaborator and bestie, Eric Clapton. There's no way that's gonna produce the first ever number one triple album or backfire spectacularly in his personal life. And Ringo is, you know... Just being Ringo. After Get Back raps, Paul goes to longtime producer and confidant George Martin, asking him to get the group back together to make a record like we used to do it. Martin agrees on one condition. He has full control over production. No Beatles sitting in the booth with him, no spouses suggesting more primal screaming, and definitely no producers like, I don't know, Phil Spector weaseling their way into the project months after the fact. Surely that won't happen to get back. John is a little disgruntled with the no primal screaming rule, but otherwise, the guys are on board. They're all on board because they kind of know this is going to be the last time. That album, with the working title of Everest, named after the brand of SIGs Jeff Emmerich smoked, was recorded from February to August of 69, with most of the work being done at EMI Studios. Work begins pretty immediately after Get Back, just a three weeks break. However, sessions halt almost immediately because Ringo is doing another film or something. Thing. Work is paused until April. Paul and John both use this break to marry their ladies. Georgie writes Here Comes the Sun at Eric Clapton's home, Hurtwood Edge. Specifically, his inspiration came from the garden. Now, I don't mean to get so self-referential, but if you remember the Layla video, if you remember what went down in that garden, then you'll know this might have been the most important garden in rock and roll history. For now, George and his wife Patty Boyd are doing okay. Okay enough that he writes her another song. The first song George wrote for Patty was I Need You, back in the help days when they were still dating. She partly inspired It's All Too Much during the Sgt. Pepper's sessions, then For You Blue during Get Back. One morning in their kitchen at Kim Fawn's, George plays Patty a song he wrote, Something. I've been through this one like for about six months, 
attracts me like a pomegranate. <laughs> now, George said later on in his life that the song wasn't about Patty. It was more a general thing about all the love the Beatles felt for their wives and blah blah blah. But I know men well enough to know that when a man has a wife number two, right, he's gonna have to bullshit a little as not to make wife number two jealous of wife number one, especially when he wrote so many songs about wife number one. And I strongly feel this principle applied for something. Like, come on, who the hell else could this song have been about? He wasn't the only guy writing about his woman, though. John brings the ballad of John and Yoko to Paul. Paul takes one look at the lyrics and I assume he went, oh good god, we're going to piss off the Americans again. But okay, this is actually pretty good, I think I'll do it. Lennon McCartney record the whole song by themselves as Ringo is off promoting his bad film and George is out of the country. Uh, this was the last time these two were on the same page about anything, really. Issues with Yoko, resenting John for voting world-class dirtbag Alan Klein to be the Beatles' new manager, and John being very vocal about his ire for Paul's big undertaking on this record drove a wedge between them as recording went on. Speaking of Yoko's presence, let's talk about the bed. So John and Yoko get in a pretty gnarly car accident, the doc ordered Yoko to be on bed rest for a few weeks. Yoko was somewhat of John's security blanket in the studio during this time. It seems he couldn't bear the thought of being away from her for that long, or maybe Yoko couldn't bear the thought of being away from him. So John brought a bed into EMI so Yoko could still watch him perform. Hey, say what you will about them, but he loved the shit out of that woman. The rest of the Beatles, however, thought this was ridiculous. The guy with the least amount of patience for her was George. Yoko sat in that very chair. Oh. <laughs> Yoko eats George's biscuits, George calls her that bitch, and right then and there, I decided that George was my man. <laughs> yeah, the others had the patience of saints for sitting through all that mess. John and Yoko were like that couple that makes out in the middle of the hallway in school. They were doing entirely too much. While some still claim it was Yoko who broke up the band, others say Alan Klein, some even say it was Paul. I am coming to you with the one true answer, yes? I know who, or rather what, broke up the biggest band in the world. Maxwell Silverhammer. It was Maxwell Silverhammer. You see it in Get Back. For some fucking reason, they did an exorbitant amount of takes of Maxwell, and the light inside all of their eyes is dying. Max Maxwell Silverhammer, be sure that she was dead. Quite a lot of the Abbey Road material had its roots in Get Back, including Paul's idea for a medley. He'd been cobbling together song fragments from as early as the India trip, like Polythene Pam and Mean Mr. Mustard, and he wants to do… something with them. He gets George Martin in on the idea, and through time it becomes known as The Long One. You Never Give Me Your Money was recorded first, and the rest of the long one was built around it. Not unlike another Lennon track, Strawberry Fields Forever, I Want You, She's So Heavy is another Frankenstein's monster of two takes. One of them just happens to have some shouting in the background, likely from one of the guys out of frustration of messing up. Uh, for a long time, it was thought to be someone in the booth shouting at John for screaming, but like, come on, it's 1960 nobody's scolding a beetle. Three takes from that first day in February were all spliced together. They're mixed down onto one tape in April. Then you have your overdubs, including Billy Preston on keys, and those got mixed down again. That's why the front half of the song sounds so different from the back half. I'm talking about the guitar tone here. It's because that back half is second gen tape while the rest is third. Because was the last track recorded for the album and it was hell to do. All of those vocal parts are so densely stacked on top of each other that if one person messes up, then the whole thing just falls apart. 
It all fell apart many times. So what is the last Beatles song? It depends on what technicalities you consider. If you're going for the last song on any Beatles album, that would be Get Back on Let It Be. But if you're going by the last released Beatles recording, as of very recently, that would not be Free as a Bird or any of the anthology stuff. Apparently, there's a new song coming. But I consider the last Beatles song to be the last track completed as a group. That would be She's So Heavy. The last session was on August 8th or 11th. The 11th could have just been the final mix, though. August 20th was the last time all these guys worked on something together. That would be the final mix and agreeing upon the final track listing of Abbey Road. John was in the studio with George when he added the noise machine at the end of She's So Heavy. John also told Jeff Emmerich exactly where to cut the tape, giving She's So Heavy and Side one, that abrupt end. That final track listing of Abbey Road goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up side one, we have come together, followed by something. Then, Maxwell's Silver Hammer. Next, Oh Darling, followed by Octopus's Garden. And side one closes with I Want You, She's So Heavy. Opening up side two, we have Here Comes the Sun, followed by Because, and then comes the long one. The medley consists of You Never Give Me Your Money, followed by Sun King, then Mean Mr. Mustard, next Polythene Pam, and She Came In Through the Bathroom Window, next Golden Slumbers, and Carry That Weight, and the album closes with The End. So this album's hidden track, Her Majesty, was written during the Get Back sessions. It was originally supposed to be placed between Mean Mr. Mustard and Polythene Pam. It was cut off because it threw off the pacing and the key change from Her Majesty to Pam would be really jarring. Paul told John Curlander to trash Her Majesty, but EMI told John not to. So he puts a good chunk of tape in between the end and Her Majesty to kind of say, hey, this is where the end is. This fragment is only here because it has to be. Don't put it on the acetate. Somewhere along the way, the note not to include Her Majesty was lost. The song makes it onto the acetate at the very end, and somehow nobody caught this. But now that I think of it, I'm not surprised, because August and September of 1969 were very chaotic times to be around the Beatles. So when Abbey Road was released on September 26th, 1969, nobody knew that Her Majesty was going to be at the end. The Ballad of John and Yoko was released as the pro single in May, and the single upon release was something backed with Come Together. Good job, Georgie! You finally got the A-side of a single! This was, of course, the last record the Beatles made as a band. Their long and drawn-out breakup would last months, if not years, on the legal front. The last record they released was that tricky Get Back thing, repackaged as Let It Be. I have a whole video on this glorious mess. So when people talk about the best Beatles records, this one comes up a lot. It's a pretty agreeable choice. But what do I think of Abbey Road? <laughs> So going in, as is well established on my channel, late stage Beatles are my favorite Beatles. I didn't realize it until I made my own little film with Because, and I wasn't sure of it until I got to listening to this one for this video in late July. Abbey Road carries the atmosphere of late summer. The sound is hazy, a little woozy. You get that right out of the gate with Come Together. This album also has a certain looseness shared between Oh Darling, Polythene Pam, and Bathroom Window. When you consider all the Beatles had pretty much accepted that Abbey Road was going to be the last go-around, this looseness 
makes sense. It translates into a certain carefree atmosphere, no doubt from the Beatles feeling free to do whatever they want after this. Their scope was getting farther and farther as they were gearing up to be their own solo guys now. I wish Billy Preston had entered the Beatles fold earlier. You see it in Get Back and you hear it on his contributions to this record. They gelled so well together. Paul's bass playing through this record is the best it's ever been. For a whole album, I'm thinking, finally, I knew he was capable of this the whole time. Now that my more general observations are out of the way, let's get into a track-by-track -track breakdown. I used to not be crazy about Come Together. When I first bought this copy and heard most of Abbey Road at age 18, I felt that Come Together was fractured. I pay special attention to how Beatles albums open. Their openers were not only statements of intent for the rest of the record, uh, they were a window into the whole group's frame of mind. Come Together isn't like the long one where it's more than the sum of its parts. Come Together is exactly the sum of its parts. Paul is the MVP of this one. He just casually whips out one of the greatest bass lines of all time for what is lyrically I Am The Walrus 2.0. Paul is pinned as the self-referential Beatle, but John's written two songs now that throw it back to other Beatles moments. Glass, Onion, and this. For lack of a better term, Come Together is just so cool. It's a cool and different way to slide into a Beatles album, and I can picture John just giggling to himself while writing this word salad of a song. Then you have Something, one of the greatest love songs ever written. What makes a great love song, to me, is the element of uncertainty. Think of God Only Knows by the Beach Boys. It opens with the line, I may not always love you. Something is about the uncertainty of love. You're asking me, will my love grow? I don't know. Stick around, it may show. The waters of young love may be choppy. Remember, all of these guys are in their 20s and some of them got married pretty young. There's still that something that sticks you together. George Martin really hit it out of the park with this song. He captured the feeling perfectly with the string swells. You get the descending harmony under the rising melody and the string plucks. It's just so sweet. But the demo is just gorgeous. You could tell even then, without all the bells and whistles, that there was just something special about something. Over the years, I've grown to love this version just as much as the album version. Oh dear god, you can hear the Clapton influence in the solo! He has no idea! Maxwell's silver hammer is cute. Octopus's garden is cute. Did both novelty songs really need to be here? In the end, I'd pick Octopus over Hammer because it's cuter, and Paul has enough going on on this record. He doesn't need Maxwell. It's a shame I'd have to sacrifice some of the best Moog work on the record, though. Christ, I know this is somehow gonna bring some diehard Silver Hammer fan out of the woodwork. It literally always does. And I hate that I like Maxwell, too. I know every word. Oh Darling feels so current. It doesn't feel like nostalgia fuel at all. It's doo-wop meets soul with a killer vocal performance by Paul. He's so harsh you could mistake him for John. Speaking of which... Yeah! She's So Heavy is one of my favorite Beatles tunes. It has been since I first heard it. It's perfectly sloppy. It's got this wonderful synergy within the looseness. Shout out to Billy for being a perfect addition. Then it gets just about as heavy as the Beatles ever got. They're hanging on to those harmonies for dear life. And then it just ends. And then there's this long pause when you sit with what the f*** you just listened to while you get up to flip over the record. There's a reason why the most popular Beatles songs were written by George. He wrote While My Guitar Gently Weeps, he wrote Something, and he wrote Here Comes the Sun. If you ask me, it's because, well, George was simply the best Beatle. But maybe a more agreeable statement is that George was the soul of the Beatles, especially in the band's later years. He was in tune with the spirituality first, and he 
was on that bluesy back to basics trend first. Here Comes the Sun is arguably the Beatles song, their signature song. The only one that could stand up to it is Hey Jude. This song is about coming out of a deep dark winter, the earth finally thawing to let spring in. This song will wreck you in the best way if you're coming out of a dark time yourself. Uh, so much of the Beatles' most iconic moments were rooted in joy. And this is the most joyful of all. As scary as the world was for young people when this album was released, uh, there was still that 60s sense of optimism. Here Comes the Sun is that. Because is Baroque pop at its finest, literally. It's a reworking of a Beethoven tune. That's literal, actual Baroque pop. I love this because it stands out for its intricacy among such a free-flowing body of material. It's very much a product of its time, though. Maybe the most Moog Moog to ever Moog. I didn't truly appreciate the bonkers meter or the dense harmonies until the instruments were gone and the vocals stood alone. If you don't see this song's beauty, listen to the love version without the backing track. And now, the long one. Out of the whole medley, You Never Give Me Your Money is the song that could stand alone best as its own thing. Uh, it's reserved and pensive, then blossoms into this brilliant, bright thing. The back half is nostalgic and accidentally anthemic. This is the first real walk down memory lane that we get. I wish 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 didn't cover up that guitar solo, though. Everyone loves the shouting and she's so heavy, but I love the little woo at the end of You Never Give Me Your Money. The guys are all comfy enough to goof off. That wasn't happening during the White Album or Get Back. That was stress-induced delirium. There's something spacey and almost across the universe-esque about Sun King. The negative space feels more distant rather than cozy, like the first half of You Never Give Me Your Money. Sun King is ephemeral. I know Her Majesty was supposed to go in Mean Mr. Mustard Polytheme Pam bathroom window, but this triad is so solid I wouldn't dream of of breaking it up. You have this zany march into the brief swinging waltz of mustard, with Pam dropping right down into it. This is the first time something feels like a song fragment, but if Mean Mr. Mustard was any longer, it would lose its charm. The build and release into Bathroom Window is fantastic, oh my god. If the medley idea was putting you off before, the charisma of this section might just win you over. This might be surprising, but Bathroom Window is my favorite song in the medley because it's the lovely Rita of Abbey Road and we all know how I feel about lovely Rita. I am the president of the lovely Rita fan club. After the dancing is done, we return to the mournful nostalgia of golden slumbers and that motif from money. It's the most grand moment here. The strings obviously craft this feeling, but I want to point out how the bass is doing an almost cello-esque thing. Paul is putting his whole soul into these vocals. It continues on to carry that weight. Cowboy Bebop fans rise up! Carry That Weight feels like a self-fulfilling prophecy. I wish the transition from this one into the end was a little smoother. This is really the only clunky moment on the long one. And lastly, the end with its solo showcase. There's so much personality infused into the guitar solos. I love how you can tell exactly who played what. This song really feels like the Beatles' final bow. It couldn't have picked any better lyrics to close with, or close with. In the end, the love you take is equal to the love you make. Wait, is the long one organized in threes? Wait, you have the prelude because, then you never give me your money, and Sun King. Then, Mr. Mustard, Polythene Pam, Bathroom Window, and lastly, uh, Golden Slumbers, The Weight, The End, oh my god it is! That took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to figure out. Ugh. As for Her Majesty, I think it's adorable. It's a little postscript to the end, like when you watch the video over and over again because you don't want to forget the night, or when you replay a voicemail over and over because you don't want him to be gone. My buddy Matthew, he doesn't like the long one. 
I never understood why, maybe it was the principle of the thing. After examining the long one closer than I ever have before for this video, I'm even more baffled as to why he wouldn't like it. I won't call Abbey Road a perfect album because I strongly believe that Don't Let Me Down should have been included. That song was way too good to be left on the cutting room floor. They included Maxwell's goddamn silver hammer over this! This might be crazy, but I would have dropped Hammer from Abbey Road. I would have moved You Never Give Me Your Money to side one, okay, I know I'm probably losing you now, I would have put Don't Let Me Down before Sun King. Don't Let Me Down would be the Sun King lead-in instead, they're basically the same song anyway, and the You Never Give Me Your Money motif might even be more powerful coming from side one. Pickiness aside, Abbey Road is just about as good as sequencing gets, perfectly paced Records with a very good selection of songs are so rare. The whole way through, the long one doesn't feel like a bunch of unfinished ideas glued together. The whole is more than the sum of its parts. This is Paul's masterwork. I think what the Beatles nailed with Abbey Road is... How do I phrase this? You feel like you've gone through a journey. You've experienced an experience. Something has moved you. You're in a different spot then than where you are now. To me, this album was each Beatle finalizing the growth into their own individual person. Each had their own wants, their own needs, their own lives to live. Abbey Road is a walk down memory lane, one last lap around your hometown before you and your childhood friends move away. This album, it feels like their parting gift to each other, and on a greater stage, this was a statement of finality from the biggest band of the 60s. Though there was technically one more album after this, Abbey Road was meant to be the swan song. And it is. The sun sets, the curtain falls, allowing it to rise again for someone, or something, else. My personal favorites off this one are Something, Oh Darling, She's So Heavy, and Because, and my favorites from the long one are You Never Give Me Your Money, Mean Mr. Mustard, Polythene Pam, and She Came In Through the Bathroom Window. Remember, if you want all my favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that is it! That was Abbey Road by the Beatles. While the White Album is firmly my favorite Beatles record, it pretty much always has been, there's some serious competition for number two between uh, Rubber Soul, Let It Be, Sgt. Peppers, and this. But what do you think? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about albums I love. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye! Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, but she doesn't have a lot to say. Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, but she changes from day to day. I want to tell her that I love her a lot, but I gotta get a belly full of wine. Her Majesty's a pretty nice girl, someday I'm gonna make her mine, oh yeah. Someday I'm gonna make her mine. Do -do